Listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to True Crime, the podcast that helps you find new, emerging, and undiscovered true crime podcasts. I'm Greg, the host and curator of True Crime. And the holiday week of episodes continues. If you're enjoying this week, drop me a tweet at Indie Drop In on Twitter or send me a DM on Instagram at Indie Drop In. I would love to hear from you. Today's episode is from Always Time for True Crime. Always Time for True Crime is a podcast that's all about the lesser known cases of murder, missing persons, and serial killers. Of course, this is a holiday episode, and it's titled The Goldmark Family. If you like today's episode, make sure to check out the episode description for links to subscribe. All right, let's get this show started. Begin. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Always Time for True Crime. I'm your host, Julia, and today's story focuses on an innocent family whose lives were savagely taken from them in their own home on Christmas Eve. Instead of Santa coming down the chimney, the Goldmark family got an intruder at their door, a man whose only mission that night was to kill them. This case really proves that terrible crimes can happen to anyone, and unfortunately, evil doesn't relent, not even on Christmas. This is the story of the Goldmark family and how their lives were taken in a cruel act of hate. It was Christmas Eve, 1985, and the Goldmark family were getting ready for a dinner party that they were hosting later that evening. 43-year-old Annie Goldmark checked on the ham in the oven before heading upstairs to take a shower. Her sons, 10-year-old Colin and 12-year-old Derek, were trying to contain their excitement for the annual evening festivities. Their Christmas stockings hung over the fireplace. Lastly, 41-year-old Charles, who to friends was known as Chuck, was also running around the house, helping get the house ready for their expected guests. But unfortunately, the Goldmarks wouldn't have the evening that they envisioned. No Christmas ham, no gingerbread dessert, no leaving cookies out for Santa. As the family of four prepared for dinner, nobody could have seen two hours into the future, when the Goldmarks would be found, stabbed and viciously beaten in their own home. But I'm getting way ahead of myself. So let's back up, all the way until 1942. If you're quick with math, you've probably figured out that Charles Goldmark was not even alive yet, but his parents, John and Sally, had just met, and had fallen in love. John was a smart guy. Raised by his father, a hard-working Austrian immigrant, John excelled in academics and went on to graduate from Harvard Law School. In 1942, while working in Washington, D.C. with the Democratic Party, John met Sally. The two quickly fell for each other, but there was one problem. Sally, raised by German immigrant parents, had taken interest in the American Communist Party during the Great Depression. She would later explain that she was really bothered by America's rates of unemployment, and she saw what fascism was doing to countries like Germany and Italy. So, seeking answers, she started to support communism. And you have to understand that at that time, being communist was just seen as radical. It wasn't like North Korea stuff. It wasn't black and white. In fact, in 1935, the American Communist Party was trying to portray itself as a democratic organization. They talked about fighting for rights of the working class, against unemployment, and against fascism. So in this time of unpredictability, a lot of Americans actually turned to the Communist Party. Sally had supported the Communist Party for the last few years, but when she met John, who was adamantly against communism, and the Communist Party switched his narrative to no longer opposing fascism, Sally stopped all support. Later, she would admit that she could see that she had made a mistake, And as I said, after World War II, she switched to supporting the Democratic Party. The two were married and soon after had two sons, the eldest being Charles. Ten years later, John Goldmark became a state legislator for the state of Washington. But when he was running for his third term, Sally's past involvement with the American Communist Party became an issue. In short, his opponents attacked him with accusations of being a communist. He lost, very badly, And honestly, this all devastated his political career. John ended up filing a lawsuit for defamation, in which he won and was rewarded $40,000, 
but that verdict was later overturned by a Supreme Court ruling. Now, while all that information and politics may have been boring to some of you, it's actually very important to this story. I promise. Basically, what you need to take away from that is that the Goldmark's reputation, mostly in politics, but even just in general, was ruined due to accusations of communism. That all happened when Charles Goldmark was in college. But after his father's political career ended, Charles followed in John's first footsteps, receiving a law degree from Yale. While at a conference in Europe, Charles met his wife, Annie. Born in France, her mother was French and her father was Swedish, so Annie spoke French, Swedish, and English, which later landed her a job as an interpreter. That's what she was doing at the conference. The couple moved to Seattle and had their first child, Derek, in 1973, and their second, Colin, in 1975. The family of four seemed perfect. The boys attended prestigious schools and were being raised bilingual yet they were the furthest things from pretentious or snobby. Charles and Annie made sure that the children knew where they had come from and what their grandparents had gone through to give them a good life in America. Every summer, the boys would go to France to visit their maternal family, practice their French, and see where their mother had grown up. Colin was a dedicated member of the school choir, while Derek was a talented artist. Both were smart kids, a few months shy of 13 years old, Derek recently started to enjoy playing cards with the adults, primarily the game of bridge. They also loved to play on their dad's computer, the sci-fi Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy being their favorite game to play on it. The whole family really enjoyed the outdoors and regularly went on family hikes. Charles actually had climbed a few mountains, and he had traveled to other continents to do so, so he's quite serious about it. His friends say that he was just a fun person to be around. Both he and Annie were incredibly kind and easygoing. Charles was always, quote-unquote, well-composed, they say. A calm individual who didn't raise his voice or lose his temper easily. Annie, as I mentioned, spoke multiple languages and was incredibly bright, and she made it clear by everything she did that her sons were her number one priority. In December of 1985, the family was looking forward to welcoming a new year. Charles' mother, Sally, had passed away a few months earlier, six years after her husband, John. But good things lay ahead. While at that time, Charles was running his own successful law firm with a few of his friends, having his own career in politics was never off the table. He had recently started to dip his toe in, having acted as the Democratic Party's legal counsel in Washington state, and in 1984, having appeared as a delegate for the presidential candidate Gary Hart at the Democratic National Convention. So many wondered if 1986 would be the year that he took his political journey a step further. Unfortunately, unbeknownst to the family, for the past six months, there had been someone concocting a plan to make sure that the Goldmark family never again would enter the political scene. That person was 27-year-old David Lewis Rice. Born in Colorado in November of 1958 to parents Estes and Gladys, David had had a troubled life since the very beginning. As a child, he never fit in. His siblings, two older brothers and a younger sister, recalled that he was always alone and was never able to make friends. Every day at school, he ate lunch alone. He walked home alone. He was bullied because he was seen as an easy target. He was different, didn't really have normal social cues, and he never fought back. David spent the majority of his childhood being moved back and forth across the southwestern states while his father looked for work which only made it more difficult to make friends. At age four, David suffered serious head injuries after he ran through a glass door while running through the house with his brothers. The damage to his head was pretty bad, and he also cut his right eye so badly that he had been deemed legally blind in that eye. There's also reports that his brothers had pushed him out of a tree one time, and he also got some really bad injuries from that. The two brothers, Gary and Randy, would later say that they definitely did tease him and rag on David, but that they never meant it maliciously. To them, that was just brotherly fights. Gary and Randy were just closer, and as a result, would often team up on David. They still very much loved him, though. Now, I want to give a trigger warning for suicide here. If you don't want to hear this, fast forward about 30 seconds. But when David was around 10, there was an incident that really opened up Gary and Randy's eyes. Some articles say he was 8, some say 10, and some even say 11. Even Randy, who told the story to the media, 
isn't really sure when it was. But when David was around that age, he and Randy got into a really big fight. As the older brother, Randy came out on top. To Randy, this was a typical brother fight, but to David, it was much more. Shortly after the fight, David was found hanging in his room. He had stepped up on his dresser and knocked it over with a handmade noose around his neck. His brothers recalled that all the color had been drained from his face, but with quick action, they were able to get him down, and David survived. Unfortunately, this would have been in the late 60s, and mental health really wasn't talked about much back then, so David did not get the help that he should have gotten. But his parents did do the best they could. They sent David to a psychiatrist for a little bit, but shortly after he had started, this psychiatrist was actually charged with child molestation. David's brothers later said that David had never commented on whether or not this psychiatrist had molested him. If he had, obviously that would have been incredibly traumatic, but I imagine that even if David wasn't a direct victim, that it would still be difficult to process that your psychiatrist was a child molester. His brother Randy said that whatever happened behind closed doors, either way, it would be difficult for David to have put that trust in that person, who he believed had his best interest in mind, only to learn that this man was sick in his own way. After that, David never saw another doctor. He was never formally evaluated or diagnosed with anything. He didn't even continue therapy. When he was 15, David dropped out of school and enrolled in the Navy, but received an honorable discharge after just two months. After leaving the Navy, he got married at 21 and fathered a son the following year. That marriage was quite short-lived, though, as shortly after his son was born, David was arrested for indecent exposure, and his wife filed for divorce. His wife and son have kept very separate and private lives. Their names aren't mentioned in the media, so it seems as though he's lost all contact with them after the divorce. To him, this was the beginning of his breakdown. By that time, his two brothers had moved to Washington, and his younger sister had gotten married. His mother was also in quite bad health. Wanting to help out their younger brother, Randy and Gary convinced David to move up to Seattle to be closer to them, which he did in 1982. But his luck really didn't get better from there. David had a difficult time holding a job and an apartment. He worked as a janitor for a few months, then as an elevator operator for a while. At one point, he had had to resort to living in his car. Finally, he got a job as a welder at a steel company. While in this position, he suffered a flash burn to his left eye damaging his cornea. And if you remember, he had already been deemed legally blind in his right eye. So this was the other one. While miraculously he still did have vision, it's said that after damaging both eyes, he had this haunting look in his eyes. Witnesses would later describe him as having dark, evil, empty eyes. And while that may be true, the reason that his eyes may look quote-unquote haunting could partially be due to these injuries. Unfortunately, this job didn't work out either, as the company was forced to lay off a bunch of employees, David being one of them. After being let go for the third or fourth time, David was searching for someone to blame, some reason for unemployment in America. David would later say in an interview, quote, Something is wrong. This country does not get in this kind of shape without somebody actually putting it in that shape. And if you look around, all you have to do is open your eyes and see that, yeah, it's being done purposely, end quote. So he was looking for an answer of why America was, in his opinion, falling. And unfortunately, when hateful people look for something to blame, often they'll point to religion or politics. In his turmoil, David found General Jack Moore in the Christian Patriots group. General Moore was a World War II and Korean War veteran, who was known for his strange conspiracies and fear-mongering. The Seattle Met actually referred to him as the Alex Jones of his time. Moore spewed hate against anything that wasn't Christian, to the point of white supremacy and extremely anti-Semitic views. And unfortunately, because he was, at least at the start, a very respected war vet, he had a platform. He gave speeches, he wrote articles and books, Articles that right-wing newspapers would then publish. I did read a few of his articles, and they're infuriating. 
I think the most infuriating part is that we still have people in 2022 who believe the same thing that Moore did. But yeah, I'm not going to go too much into that because I'm not going to repeat his hatefulness. But like some of the things besides being totally racist, some of the things that he would hate on was sex education in schools, therapy, sensitivity training. He said that this would actually weaken the next generation. In reality, this man, who had survived a Korean prisoner of war camp, was probably suffering from a lot of PTSD and other illnesses, and instead of getting help, he decided to turn that trauma into hate, and on top of that, spread it to others. So David, who was also very mentally ill, took to those ideas. He would read Moore's articles and even call his office hoping to get a chance to talk to him. Then, in late 1984, he met Anne Davis. Anne was a naturopathic physician who David had gone to for help to quit smoking. They had a few sessions where they tried hypnosis and stuff, and despite their 14-year age difference, Anne was 40, their relationship grew close. The two started a sexual relationship, and David even moved in with her. While getting to know Anne, she introduced David to a club that she was a high member of. I believe she was actually the treasurer. They called it the Duck Club. The Duck Club was a right-wing group that would describe themselves as quote-unquote rabid constitutionalists who were quote devoted to conservative economics, end quote. It's alleged that they talked about their anti-communist beliefs and how communism was going to ruin America. It's also alleged that they too were anti-Semitic. Between this group and the conspiracy stuff from Jack Moore, David began to believe that communists were trying to take over America, and that as a Christian American, he had to fight the war against communism. He also grew to believe, after hearing it from Jack Moore, that Jewish people were controlling the IRS and the Federal Reserve in America. He told people that the Jews had a communist army, some in Canada and some in Mexico, and they were going to come in from both sides and invade America. Moore had actually written in one of his articles that there were more than 70,000 troops on the other side of the border, quote, waiting for the word of the Federal Reserve to take over, end quote. While David's obviously racist and he's a murderer and, and, you know, a terrible person, it is sad that he believes this. Like, I was reading all this and there's even interviews in which he's trying to explain that America is going to be invaded. And it's very obvious he is mentally ill. It's definitely not an excuse for his hateful beliefs or his later actions, and I don't feel bad for him, but it is sad to see someone mentally struggling like that. Not because, again, not because I feel bad for him, but because it's just disheartening to see how mental illness can spread so much hate. I just want to make sure I'm being very clear that I do not condone his actions at all. After attending a few meetings at the Duck Club, he learned of the gold marks and the accusations against the family back in the 1960s. And just so you know, nobody besides David has ever been charged in connection with the Goldmarks murders, so I want to be very careful about accusing people. But basically, David, maybe on his own or maybe by the influence of others, comes under the belief that the Goldmarks are communist, and that John Goldmark is the leader of the Communist Party. Yes, John, not Charles. John who at this point is already dead. But David doesn't do research into who's alive and who isn't. He just treats the family as a whole. I'll get into this more in a bit. For the next year, he expanded on these ideas more and more, branding himself a quote-unquote soldier of the fight. And this is where members of the Duck Club said that they started to disagree with him. To them, it was clear that he was going off the rails. According to them, they never condoned his violent thoughts. David began telling everyone who would listen that a civil war and a nuclear holocaust was coming. He even drew up a blueprint for a shelter that he was planning on building. His plan was to set up a rescue camp in Colorado after the war, and he thought that he was going to be a hero. He talked of buying camouflage clothing and weapons, and eventually purchased a semi-automatic rifle. But it got really bad when he apparently started to hear voices. David explained that he had telepathy, and he was able to communicate with what he called friends in outer space. When later asked about the messages that he received from these so-called friends, he said that they didn't come to him like actual voices, 
but as ideas or instructions. He believed that people in outer space were sending him telepathic messages on how to save the world. He also told his roommate slash girlfriend, Ann Davis, I don't really know what to call her. I don't think they ever officially were a couple, but she does say that they had a sexual relationship at one point. So I'm just going to say roommate, I guess. So he told his roommate, Ann, that there was some sort of black box in his head. I don't know if he was referring to like a black box on an airplane like some kind of data recorder. Anne said that he told her he kept ideas in his black box, in his brain. Like if he had a problem that he couldn't solve right away, he said that he stored it in the black box. Obviously, we wouldn't really understand what he meant by this. It only makes sense to him. Anne says that once David took this kind of turn, she and other members of the Duck Club had noticed an increased intensity in his behavior, and they did begin to suspect that he was mentally ill. She even mentioned to him that he should talk to somebody, but unfortunately, he didn't get the help that he needed. We're going to take an ad break here, but we'll be back in just a moment. And we're back with Always Time for True Crime, the killing of the Goldmark family. As David continued to go downhill, Anne asked him to move out and requested that he be gone by the time that she got back from her holiday on December 28th. This may have been the push that David needed to start acting out his plan. Shortly before Christmas of 1985, David's quote-unquote friends from outer space sent him instructions on how to eliminate the communist attack that he believed was coming. They had to kill the regional director of the American Communist Party. And this voice apparently told him that Charles Goldmark was that leader. Now here's where David got confused on who Charles was. Somehow, David was under the impression that Charles and Ani were John and Sally. He thought that they were the ones who had been accused of communism back in the 60s. So while he knew the name Charles, he was actually thinking that it was John that he would be attacking. Clearly, this makes no sense because John and Sally had since passed away. But David, I guess, didn't know that. While he had read that Charles was a successful attorney in Seattle... He had never seen Charles. Since he thought Charles was John, he was expecting to attack some 80-year-old man, not 41-year-old Charles. So on Christmas Eve, he headed over to the Goldmark residence. He had gotten the address from an old newspaper clipping that had publicly printed the Goldmark's address and a picture of the house because it was big news that this family had moved into this wealthy neighborhood. Like, how crazy is it that papers used to literally print people's addresses? In the weeks leading up to the attack, David had gone over to the house three times. Walked around, checked out entry points, observed the neighbors, just trying to plan everything out. Like I said, he never saw Charles Goldmark. And I have to wonder that if he did see the family, maybe getting into their car or something, I wonder if he would have noticed that they weren't John and Sally. But who knows? Just before 7 p.m., David approached the neighborhood carrying an empty white box. He planned to knock on the door and say that he was from a taxi company and that he had a package for Charles. Once Charles came to the door, he would attack. I mentioned earlier that he had recently purchased a rifle. Well, he later told detectives that about two weeks before Christmas, he threw the rifle away because he said not only was it too big to carry around, but it was very loud and it was just going to draw too much attention. So on Christmas Eve day, he went to a toy store and purchased a $3 toy gun that actually looked very realistic. And that's what he brought to the Goldmark house, a toy gun. He also brought along chloroform and some rags, as well as two sets of handcuffs. In a tizzy, David actually approached the wrong house, arriving at the Goldmark's next door neighbor. He announced he had a package for Charles Goldmark and the lady who answered the door directed him to the right address. Finally, he got to the Goldmark's door and knocked. A young boy, who we later learned was 10-year-old Colin, answered the door. In his confession, David later said that he was quite shocked when Colin answered the door. Because again, remember, he thinks that Charles and Annie are elderly. So he had no idea that children were going to be home. He hadn't done any research on the family to learn that the couple had two kids. And I actually do believe that that's true, because he only brought two rags with him to soak in chloroform, and only two sets of handcuffs. 
which kind of suggests that he did only intend on having two victims. Either way, he still could have backed out. If he really didn't want to hurt the kids, he still could have abandoned the plan. But he didn't. While a bit rattled, he asked Colin to go get his dad, Charles. Colin hollered and Charles came down the stairs to give the stranger a welcoming hello. But as soon as he confirmed that he was indeed Charles Goldmark, David pulled out the toy gun, grabbed Charles by the shirt, and kicked the front door closed. Terrified, Colin ran away to the kitchen. David pushed Charles to the floor with his foot and asked him where Annie was. Charles calmly informed him that his wife was upstairs in the shower. David then told him to call back his son, and was surprised when Charles called two boys to the front foyer. Again, David was flustered. He didn't know there were two kids. He led the three upstairs and into the parents' bedroom. Wrapping paper and last-minute gifts still lay on the carpeted floor, waiting to be wrapped. A traditional Scandinavian holiday dress was set out on the bed. Friends said that Annie wore it every Christmas Eve. David recalled to detectives how calm Charles was throughout the whole thing, probably for the sake of his kids. He called to Annie, who was in the ensuite bathroom, and asked her to put something on and come out. She promptly put on a robe and joined the others in the room as she learned that there was an intruder in the house. Charles, still cool and collected, asked David if he wanted any money, to which David replied, quote, Yes, I can use all you've got, end quote. Charles handed him his wallet, which only had $14 in it. David was disappointed. He assumed that they would have had more cash than that. While theft wasn't really the motive, he said that he thought of it as an added bonus, that they'd probably have some money to help him get by for a while. He then asked Charles for his PIN number, and Charles answered. He would later find out, though, that that was actually a fake PIN. He instructed all four family members to lie face down on the floor, and used the two sets of handcuffs to immobilize Charles and Annie. As he retrieved the rags and chloroform, Annie whimpered, quote, He's going to kill us, end quote. Most likely in a desperate attempt to save his family, before David could soak the rag, Charles told him that they were expecting company due to arrive at 7.30, in just 20 minutes. He was probably hoping that maybe David would take off. I'm sure Charles thought that the motive was financial, so he's probably thinking that David already got the cash, and he thinks he has the PIN number, so maybe if I tell him that company's coming, he's going to leave. Charles was also probably thinking of the safety of his guests, because remember, he thinks that David's gun is real. Unfortunately, this had the opposite effect. Knowing that people were coming soon, David thought that he better hurry up and get the killings over with. He later told detectives that his original plan was to torture Charles for information first hoping he would give up the names of the other communists in his group. But now on a time crunch, he had no time. He chloroformed them one by one, starting first with Charles, then Annie, and then the children. With them knocked out, he ran downstairs to look for a weapon. In his confession, David admitted that he went through the kitchen looking for a meat cleaver. He wanted to beat them to death, but all he found were knives. He commented to investigators that he didn't like the idea of cutting someone. A knife was not his first weapon of choice. He chose a fillet knife and went to go downstairs to look for some tools, but instead he passed the laundry room and noticed a steam iron. He decided to take both the steam iron and the knife up to the bedroom. When he returned to the second floor, David recalled that he stopped to think. He looked at the children lying on the ground. Killing children was too evil, he told himself. But then, he also thought, well, they've already seen my face. And he comforted himself by telling himself that he was a soldier. And sometimes, soldiers have to kill even when they don't want to. I'll give a quick trigger warning here because it does get violent and it does involve children. David first hit Charles Goldmark over the head with the iron five times. Then, he did the same to an eagle, Mark. After hitting her a few times, Annie started to move. Perhaps the chloroform was starting to wear off. David then hit her a few more times, and finally, she lay still. Next, he bent over the two boys, later telling officers that he hit, quote, the one with the glasses first, end quote. That was 12-year-old Derek. 
Lastly, he beat 10-year-old Colin. David took a few breaths and stared at what he had done. The guest would be there any minute. He had to hurry. He went over to Charles to check for a pulse, and to his surprise, found one. Mr. Goldmark was still alive. It gets a bit more gruesome here, so just another warning. When he hit Charles over the head with the iron, he had broken the skin and made a pretty nasty head wound. So David then took the knife he had brought and stabbed Charles in the head, right into the wound. In his confession, David would detail how he stuck the knife into the victim's head, five inches deep, and, quote, stirred it around, end quote. Confident that Charles was now deceased, David checked Anise's pulse. She, too, was still alive. But unlike her husband, Anise didn't have a gaping head wound. She had a gash, but it's reported that Charles' skull had actually been cracked, so David was able to insert the knife into his brain. He couldn't do that with a knee. Instead, he stabbed her in the neck and the chest, noting that it took quite a lot of pressure to do so. Finally, he turned to the boys and did the same thing to them as he did their father, inserting the knife into their brains and, as he described, stirring it around. Noticing blood on his jacket and his boots, he wiped the blood with a shirt and stuffed it into his pocket. He tossed a blanket over Colin and Derek, unable to look at them. Then he noticed the time. It was 7.20 p.m. He had to get out of there. He found the back door and escaped through an alley. Since he was covered in blood, though, David knew that he couldn't take the bus. So he began walking two miles back to the apartment that he shared with Anne. But there was one problem. Well, actually, two problems. First, David stopped at an ATM on the way home to get some money using Charles' card. He was furious when he discovered that he had been given a false pin and threw the card into a bush as he walked home. The next problem came when he was more than halfway home. David realized, shit, I left my handcuffs there. He had been pretty careful not to leave evidence, having worn gloves while holding the knife and the iron. But the handcuffs they could possibly find him through those. He was already close to home, so he decided to go back to the apartment, change, and then he could take the bus back and grab the handcuffs. Meanwhile, however, friends of the Goldmarks had shown up for Christmas Eve dinner. When they arrived, all the lights in the house were turned off, but they knocked anyway. When nobody answered, the friends thought that maybe the Goldmarks were playing a prank on them. Confused, a few of them sat on the front porch waiting for about 15 minutes. When it became clear that this in fact was not a silly prank, the friends went over to another friend's house. This friend had a spare key to the Goldmark house. Then they all went back together and let themselves in. When they walked in the front door, they were hit with the smell of ham cooking in the oven. The table was set for 10, stockings were hung up, everything seemed fine. But then they heard a faint moaning coming from upstairs. Following the noise, they stumbled upon the grisly scene. The four gold marks lay on the ground, all covered in blood. The moaning was coming from Charles, slowly lifting his handcuffed hands and whimpering the words, hurt. Some of the guests rushed to call 911, while others used tools to cut the handcuffs off of Charles Goldmark. A team of 14 medics arrived and immediately began life-saving measures. Blood saturated the carpet and pieces of brain tissue were found on the iron, as well as where the two boys had been lying. To everyone's shock, Charles, Colin, and Derek all still had a pulse. Annie, on the other hand, was pronounced dead at the scene. Her autopsy would later reveal that the stab wound to the neck had severed her spinal cord, paralyzing her. She would have died quickly after the stab wounds. The three surviving members were immediately taken to hospital. But as detectives arrived, medics informed them that, while they had only one fatality, they expected more to follow. It was a miracle that they were even alive at this point. Police removed Denise's handcuffs and collected them for evidence, along with the two murder weapons. As a forensics team went over the scene, investigators interviewed friends and family, looking for a possible motive. Everyone had nothing but good things to say about the gold marks. Everyone loved them. There were no marital problems, nothing. 
Detectives knew that they wouldn't be able to get any information from the victims themselves. Charles, Derek, and Holland were all comatose. But as police canvassed the neighborhood, the Goldmark's next-door neighbor came forward, telling them that a man had come by her house earlier, asking for Charles. She described him as tall, over six feet, skinny, dark hair, and hollow eyes. Almost crazy eyes, she said. Police looked into this to see if there were actually any deliveries scheduled for the gold mark that night, but no luck. They suspected that this was the killer, and began making a sketch. Back at his apartment, David stashed his bloody clothes in his room and went back outside to go back to the gold mark's house. But as he got close, he saw police cars parked outside. David panicked. He had touched those handcuffs without gloves on. Surely his fingerprints would be all over them. He turned around to walk back home, but this time, as he approached his apartment, he saw a few people standing outside his unit. David assumed that they were probably looking for him, that police were already on to him. He couldn't risk going back to that apartment. Honestly, it was probably just people coming over for Christmas and looking for their friend's unit, but David had no idea. With nowhere to go, David spent the night riding the bus, walking in parks, just hanging around. The next day, he went to the house of Homer Brand, the president of the Duck Club. He caught Homer just as he was leaving for a Christmas party and asked if he could talk, but Homer said that he was really busy and had to get going. David then started rambling about how he had, quote, dumped the top communist, end quote. He said that the police were now after him. Homer would later say that he didn't really take anything David said seriously. He just figured it was one of his rants. So Homer ignored David's confession and hurried off to his Christmas party. Next, David visited another member of the Duck Club, Mr. Robert Brown. Robert said that he didn't really know David too well. He knew he was friends with Anne and had gone to a few meetings at the club, but that was it. He was surprised when David turned up at his door on Christmas Day, saying that he needed a place to sleep. In the spirit of Christmas, Robert let him stay. David quickly crashed into the spare bedroom and fell asleep leaving his belongings in the living room. While his guest was sleeping, Robert noticed something that David had written. Now, I'm not sure what this was written on. I did see one report that said it was written on a tablet. Another said a notebook. And excuse my ignorance, I wasn't alive in 1985, so I don't know what kind of tablet David would have been able to afford. I do remember, like, Palm Pilots and stuff back in the 90s. So I was thinking something kind of like that. But I looked at prices, and these things were pretty expensive. So I'm not sure how David would have afforded one. I don't want to get hung up on this minute detail, though. So let's just say he wrote something down. Maybe on a tablet, maybe on a notebook. And then left it on Robert's coffee table. When Robert stumbled upon it, he couldn't help but read what he saw. Quote, To whom it may concern, I am the person you are looking for in the Goldmark case. I know that what I did was a very terrible thing. That is why I am as you see me now. I want it perfectly understood that no one else had anything whatsoever to do with what I did. I went to great lengths to make sure of that. The person that I live with doesn't even know that I am wanted on a different charge. She received a couple of messages on her machine, but I erased them before she got to them. I did not use the rifle that I purchased a few weeks ago. Instead, I fooled them with a toy pistol, which you will find in the storage locker. I threw the rifle away a couple of weeks ago. Again, I want it understood that no one knew anything about this, so please do not cause any unnecessary suffering to innocent people. I think that I've already done enough. I guess I should tell you why I did what I did. That way you won't have to ask other people about it. My life is a mess. It has been since my wife left. Anne has been trying to help me straighten it out, but I'm afraid. And then it just cuts off, as if he had just stopped writing. And to be clear, when he says the person that I live with doesn't even know that I'm wanted on a different charge, I'm pretty sure that refers to an indecent exposure charge against him. When Robert read this, he hadn't actually heard about the Goldmarks attacks yet. While it was huge news, because they were a pretty popular family, Robert hadn't watched the news on Christmas Day, so he had no idea. But he knew one thing. Something was wrong. This letter just didn't sit right with him. We're going to take an ad break here, and we'll be back in just a minute. And we're back with always time for true crime. When David woke up on Boxing Day, Robert said that he was going out to buy cigarettes. 
but really he went out to see if he could get a copy of today's paper. While out, he asked a couple people if they had heard anything about a murder in town involving the gold marks. Everyone he talked to was surprised that he hadn't heard of it and explained what had happened. That's when Robert realized that he had a murderer sitting back in his apartment, drinking coffee out of his cups, watching TV on his couch. Hell, he had just spent the night with the guy. With a sick feeling, he called the Seattle Police Department from a payphone across the street from his apartment. He explained the situation, and police immediately sent out a unit. But at that very moment, David happened to look out the window and see Robert on the phone. He must have found it suspicious that he was using a payphone, rather than just coming home to use the landline, and he put two and two together. He realized he had left his note out in the open on the coffee table. Robert must have seen it. Without even taking a moment to grab his things, David ran from the apartment, just as police were pulling up. Robert pointed to David as he booked it down the street, and in their patrol car, officers quickly caught up to him. David knew it was over, and stopped running. As he did, he took out a glass vial from his pocket and guzzled it down. Investigators later learned that it was liquid nicotine, maybe an attempt to kill himself. Detective Rudy Saltovich recalled in the book You Belong to Me by Anne Rule that the first thing he noticed about David was the likeliness between him and the sketch that the Goldmark's neighbor had done. Quote, she said she'd never forget those eyes, and I could see why. They were very distinct. Far away. Yes, vacant. End quote. Also keep in mind, though, I mentioned that he had suffered injuries to both eyes. David was brought to the station for questioning, where he was advised of his rights and appointed a lawyer. When asked about the note, David confirmed that he had written it. Detective Soltovich asked him if he cared to finish it. Remember, the note had been abruptly cut off. David said yes at first, but then he changed his mind, saying that he'd rather just talk about it than write it down. He was told by his lawyer that he didn't have to say anything, but David again said that he wanted to talk. He told Soltovich about his plan to kill the Goldmarks, how Charles was the regional director of the Communist Party. The officers looked confused and wondered where he was getting all this from, but David explained how communists were trying to take over America almost like the officers were stupid for not being aware. Then he told detectives that he'd been planning the attack for about six months. And then finally, in December, he'd received messages giving him the go-ahead. He admitted that he had scoped out the house two or three times before the attack, and how he had been confused when he realized that Charles was not elderly, and in fact had young children. He continued on with his confession, all about how he had led the family upstairs, how he knocked them out with chloroform, and how he knew he didn't have much time before the drug would wear off. When detectives asked him if he had ever worked with chloroform before, David nonchalantly told them that he had experimented with it on himself. He had knocked himself out with chloroform and timed how long it kept him unconscious, in preparation. All in all, once typed out, his confession covered 77 pages. After the interview, police searched the apartment that he shared with Anne, where they found his bloody clothes and the keys to the handcuffs found on Mr. and Mrs. Goldmark. David also led them to where he had thrown away Charles's bank card. David Lewis Rice was arrested on investigation of murder while they got the arrest warrants, preparing to charge him with one count of first-degree murder, three counts of attempted murder, as well as other charges of assault and burglary. But then, police got the news from the hospital. On December 28th at 2.05 a.m., 10-year-old Colin Goldmark died from his injuries. A second murder charge pended. As the news of an arrest was broadcasted on the news, those who knew David were shocked to find out what he did. While most who met him could tell that he was different, maybe even that he was mentally ill, nobody said he was violent. His brother Randy said that his brother had never shown any signs of being a violent person. The opposite, in fact. When David was bullied as a child, he would just sit there and take it. He never laid a hand on anyone. Randy noted that David was good with his four children, too. He knew his brother needed help, describing him as, quote, emotionally disturbed, end quote. But he never imagined it would lead to this. On January 2nd, 1986, David Rice pleaded innocent by reason of insanity, and a psychiatric evaluation was ordered. While doctors interviewed David, the charges changed once again. At 9.47 a.m., On January 9th, 1986, the third member of the Goldmark family was pronounced dead. 
41-year-old Charles Goldmark. Hope began to dwindle for the Goldmark's loved ones. 12-year-old Derek still remained in critical condition. If he did miraculously survive, he'd be an orphan and live with severe disabilities. In mid-January, nurses announced that Derek's condition had been upgraded, from critical to serious. Many wondered if he would be able to pull through. But unfortunately, after contracting pneumonia, his condition returned to critical, and he passed away on January 30th, 1986. The entire Goldmark family was gone. In May 1986, David Lewis Rice went on trial for four counts of first-degree aggravated murder. Psychiatrists had labeled him legally sane, but incredibly disturbed with schizoid and paranoid features. Most importantly, though, he knew right from wrong. David had openly said that he did feel bad for what he did to the children, and said that if he had known children would be home, he would have altered his plan. He even referred to the fact that he had his own six-year-old son. He didn't want to kill the kids, but sometimes soldiers have to kill, he said. That there shows that he knew it was wrong. His lawyers, Tony Savage and Bill Lanning, were still hoping to prove to the jury that he was insane under law. But the prosecution, led by Bill Downing, was going for the death penalty. The prosecution pointed out that the murders were premeditated and argued that David killed not because he was insane, but because he wanted to impress members of the Duck Club by killing these so-called communists and because his roommate had just kicked him out and he was desperate for money. He also told jurors that this was not a case of sane versus insane, but simply a man motivated by racism, anti-Semitic, and anti-communist beliefs. The defense, on the other hand, pointed towards David's long history of mental illness, including his suicide attempt at age 10 or 11. They blamed the Duck Club for putting these thoughts in David's head, arguing that David couldn't have come up with these ideas on his own. Defense attorney Bill Lanning compared the Duck Club to a neo-Nazi organization, one that preys on people like David, uneducated, mentally unstable, and easily influenced. Quote, If this man had not come under the influence of those people, undoubtedly this act never would have been committed. It isn't my thought that they did it deliberately. It's my thought that most of those people are not thinking clearly. The man was acting under the influence of others. End quote. The defense even got one of the psychiatrists who evaluated David to admit that the Duck Club should share, quote, at least a moral responsibility for what happened to the Goldmarks, end quote. The most interesting evidence, though, was the confession itself. The tape was played for the jury, and while the prosecution hoped that it would show them how the crime was planned out, what the jury really focused on was David's mental state. Throughout the hours-long interview, David remained aloof, describing the horrible things he had done to the Goldmarks, all while justifying it with his talk about being a soldier and having to fight the war. Quote, Like I said, it was war. War is war. I don't know what I can say. I think I probably had about the same sentiment as any other soldier. Um, hey, I don't like to kill, but sometimes it can't be avoided. End quote. A psychologist who was present for the interview then says, quote, But there wasn't a war. Nobody appointed you and you weren't a soldier. End quote. To which David replies, quote, I was, and I still am. End quote. He mentions that while he admits that it was his hands that did the murder, it wasn't his mind. He explains on the tape how he was instructed to do it by the voices from outer space. Yet I think people, especially back in the 80s when mental illness wasn't as talked about, people expected him not to be coherent. You know how people with mental illness were betrayed back in the day? In the movies, they always exaggerated a character's mental illness. So when the jury watched the tape, they were surprised to see David speaking intelligently, coherently. He wasn't acting unstable or unpredictable. He just sat there calmly drinking coffee and explaining how he had just killed four people. Which, to me, shows mental illness. But back then, I feel like they expected different behavior. I think in 2022, it's clear to anyone who would listen to that tape that he is very mentally ill. But was he insane? And even if he was, did that make him not responsible for his crimes? I mean, just because you're mentally ill, it doesn't mean that you don't have consequences. 
On June 5, 1986, a jury of six men and six women took five hours to deliberate. If they found him guilty, he'd be sent to prison. If they found him not guilty by reason of insanity, he would go to a mental institution. They announced that they rejected his insanity plea and found him guilty of four counts of first-degree murder. But they still had to decide whether to recommend life in prison or the death penalty. Five days later, they returned to court. David's brother addressed the jury, asking them to spare his brother's life. He asked them not to take the life of someone who was mentally ill and someone who was incapable of feeling emotion. Quote, it would be like hanging a robot, end quote. Randy agreed that his brother should not be let out on the streets, but that he shouldn't be put to death. When asked what he thought, David told the media that he was willing to die for what he did. However, when the jury announced that they had reached a decision, David swallowed a huge chunk of chewing tobacco, and as a result, became unresponsive. So EMTs had to come in and take him to the hospital to have his stomach pumped. The judge decided, either way, with or without David, that the jury should read their verdict. The jury foreman said that they believed that this was the kind of crime that the death penalty was meant for, and therefore, they suggested that David be condemned to die, either by lethal injection or hanging. After a few days in the hospital, David made a full recovery and was put on suicide watch. To no surprise to anyone, David's lawyers immediately started working on an appeal. They said that his death penalty should be overturned because of his mental illness, but it was rejected. David lost three appeals, until 1993, when U.S. District Judge Jack Tanner threw out David's death sentence on a technicality. Judge Tanner ruled that, quote, Defendants have the right to be present in court when their presence may affect the outcome of the trial, end quote. Basically, because David wasn't in the courtroom when he was sentenced to death, his rights had been violated. Never mind the fact that the reason he wasn't there was because he decided to poison himself with nicotine. It was 100% his fault that he wasn't present. Plus, would the jury really have changed their mind after deciding to put him to death, but then seeing him in court? Being like, oh, you know what? Never mind. Seeing his face has really changed my mind. Well, apparently, Judge Tanner thought that it was possible. Whether you're for or against the death penalty, that's a stupid reason to throw the sentence out. Without making this into a huge debate, I could understand if it was thrown out on the basis that he was mentally ill, but on a technicality, that seems dumb. But it doesn't end there, guys. Because in 1996, the state appealed Judge Tanner's decision, and 11 judges were sent to deliberate David's fate. In 1996, the judges came back in favor of the death penalty, 6 to 5. So now, he's back on death row. But then, in 1997, David's team appeals again and asks for a whole new trial, which shockingly he was granted. Friends and family of the Goldmarks were not happy because they didn't want to have to go through this again. Another trial would bring back horrible memories 12 years later. There was also an issue now with David's confession. While I don't know all the details, his lawyers were now arguing that it should have been deemed inadmissible. And according to the papers at the time, they actually had a pretty good chance of proving that. If they didn't have the confession, that was really risky. I mean, I still think if he had gone through a trial without the confession, he would have been found guilty either way. Like they had his bloody clothes and the toy gun that he had used and his fingerprints on the handcuffs. But still, the confession getting thrown out would have been a really big deal. Fortunately, though, the Goldmark's loved ones would not have to go through another trial. In 1998, David agreed to plead guilty in his second trial in exchange for the death penalty being taken off the table. Finally, 13 years after the murders, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And that's where David Lewis Rice, now 64, remains today. As for the Goldmark family, their legacy has not been forgotten. In 1986, friends and family set up the Goldmark Foundation, which raises money for good causes in Seattle to show what the Goldmark family stood for, what they valued, and just to make something beautiful out of this terrible tragedy. The foundation has contributed to the Harbeyview Medical Center, where Charles, Colin, and Derek were treated, 
and the Victims Assistant Unit of the Seattle Police Department. They've also given grants to programs that help children from less fortunate families have a chance to go to summer camp. Since Anie was from France, the Goldmark Foundation has worked a lot with the Seattle Not Sister City Association, which is a nonprofit organization that promotes cultural exchanges between the people of Seattle and Not France. And they've also partnered with the nonprofit Legal Foundation of Washington to help law students get internships and to get legal help for organizations who can't afford it, which Charles Goldmark was really passionate about. In 1992, the foundation created the Goldmark Overlook. A plaque was placed near where the family was killed, and the view overlooks Lake Washington. On it, it says, quote, This overlook is named in memory of Charles, Annie, Derek, and Colin Goldmark, who love Seattle and its open spaces, end quote. And there's also a picture of the four of them on it. The Goldmarks truly had so many people who loved them, and it's evident through all the efforts made to continue their legacy. The Goldmarks were completely innocent people killed for no reason. If you really think about it, this all started with a stupid rumor back in the 1960s. A rumor that the family were communist. I think this case really shows how far hate can go. Even if you're not the one acting on it, you can really see how people hating on the Goldmarks and fueling these rumors later influenced the Duck Club and then David. Obviously, the only person who's truly responsible is David Lewis Rice. But it's a good reminder that spreading rumors and hate is dangerous, and you never really know how far somebody else might take it. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Always Time for True Crime. Whatever holiday you're celebrating this week, or whether you're just enjoying some time off from work or school, stay safe out there, and I'll be back soon with another episode. In the meantime, you can follow me on social media. All of my social links are always in my show notes. And you can also see pictures from this episode. There's a link in my show notes that will go to my website, or you can see them on social media. Again, thanks guys. I'll be back soon. Thanks again for listening to True Crime by Indie Drop-In Network. If you would like to nominate a true crime podcast to be featured, just send me a tweet at Indie Drop-In. I'd also love to hear if one of our featured podcasts is now your favorite show. Indie Drop-In survives off ad revenue and listener donations. If you would like to contribute, please consider buying me a coffee. You can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Indie Drop-In. If you look at the very bottom of the episode description, I put a link in there to make it really easy. Indie Drop-In has many other shows that you also might like. Just go to IndieDropIn.com. All right, see you next week.